Well, before we really get started, I, I want to show a couple slides just to remind everyone of where we've been. Uh, of course, we're, we're actually concluding our study of, of Mark today, officially. Uh, and let's see if we have all these <coughs> different parts of Mark. Well, we, we started in the wilderness uh, with John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus in chapter 1, and quickly moved into a larger section where we looked at the discerning the person of Jesus, who Jesus is, and uh, his ministry around the, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and then we moved into a section from chapter 8 on, the on-the-way section of discipleship, where we, uh, he was really focusing in on his disciples and, and looking at accepting his mission as the key theme in that section. Uh, and then we finally got to Jerusalem. And the issue there, we said, was really focusing on the issue of faithfulness. Will they remain faithful in the face of persecution, opposition, danger, all these things? these things that may uh, prevent them or challenge their willingness to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Jesus. Well, today's passage uh, encompasses the last section, and that is the part of it at the tomb. We actually start at the cross, but we finish at the tomb. And uh, today's passage, actually, I have to say, well, this is kind of the structural layout of the whole thing, so you can see where the verses are, but we, can, we don't need to spend a lot of time there. It actually reminds me of this movie. Have you guys ever seen The NeverEnding Story? Um, this movie was produced in 1984, and along with a lot of movies produced around that time, is rather bizarre. Uh, it was this era that produced films that starred people like David Bowie. So you can imagine what this kind of film uh, was like. I actually really enjoyed this film growing up. My sister and I really enjoyed watching it. Um, but this really reminds me of our passage in Mark. And that's because what's, what goes on in this movie, it's about uh, this, this boy in the real world who finds this book called The Neverending Story, and he begins reading it. And it's about this fantastical adventure of this main character, the hero, Atreyu, who has to save this realm. And he's on this quest to save the world. Uh, and so this boy is reading about this story, and as it goes on, there almost seems to be manifestations of the story in his own world. Well, <laughs> Atreyu, he nears the end of his quest. He's trying to save the world from the darkness that's trying to overtake that realm and rescue the princess to get a cure to the, to the queen or princess. But in the end... He kind of fails. He, he, he actually, sorry it's a spoiler, but you've had since 1984 to watch it, so I'm going to give you the, the ending. He, he actually, the, the, the darkness overtakes him, Atreyu, the hero in the story. And in the end, the, the queen or the princess, she, she actually calls out the name of the boy, Bastion, who's in the attic of his school in... Washington State, in the real world, she calls out his name, and he, he's shocked and afraid and almost unwilling to be incorporated into the story. And that's what, that's what reminds me about the passage today, because the way that this, the way that Mark finishes is actually an invitation for us to be incorporated into this gospel. So let's read through. Um, well, I, I need to make a comment about where we're actually finishing the book of Mark today because there's a disputed ending for this gospel. We're actually concluding our study of Mark in Mark 16, 8, uh, which you'll read in a lot of your versions that it continues from 9 to 20. So what's that all about? Uh, just this little side note here while we're finishing with 16.8. Our oldest and most uh, uh, trusted and reliable manuscripts uh, don't have that longer ending of Mark. And so the older, more reliable reading of Mark finishes in 16.8. But somewhere along the, uh, along the way, a, a scribe or a copyist wasn't really satisfied with the book ending in Mark 16.8, and so likely made an addition. Several different editions were added along the way, and, and, but, but one of them kind of took hold 
and got replicated as these manuscripts were copied by further copyists on through the centuries um, until they, they kind of became well represented in a lot of different copies and manuscripts further on down the line. So it's actually relatively easy by comparing these manuscripts through the process of textual criticism to determine that these verses at the end are really were not in the original autograph of the book of Mark that Mark wrote. You can compare the syntax, the grammar, the vocabulary, the awkward transition from verse 8 to verse 9, and it, it becomes readily apparent that this was added later by someone other than Mark. But it's been included in a lot of your Bibles because it is in a lot of rather old manuscripts, and it has a long tradition of the kind of textual tradition of the book of Mark. But but I can assure you, and I'd love to go into it more with you if you need to, that we can reliably say that the gospel writer, Mark, he finished in verse 8. So that's where we're finishing our study today. And that's rather important for what he's doing with this section. So let me read our text, verses 1540 on through 168. Now there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and Jose, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was himself looking for the kingdom of God, took, chalk, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid, it, laid him in a tomb that had been cut of, out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jose were, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us uh, from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. <clears throat> and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Well, as I said before, we are... I don't think we need to leave it there. <laughs> you might get distracted by that movie poster. We'll go back here. Um, we said we're, we're at the cross at this point, and we're introduced yeah. to these three women. But, but who are they more precisely? Mary Magdalene, which we, we don't have much in, in Mark about her, but from Luke 8 we know that she is someone from whom uh, was d seven demons were cast out. So at some point in Jesus' ministry, he had encountered this woman and liberated her from seven demons that possessed her. She obviously had had a powerful encounter with Jesus. And then Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and Jose. Now, we actually know this from Mark 6, and the, the, the stating of who she was and who her, who her children were, that this is actually Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is his mother. And then Salome, we know to be the mother of James and John. In fact, she's the wife of Zebedee. So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, this is their mother, Salome. But they, they get their, they're named in their own right. They are um, announced as fo having followed him from the beginning. In fact, they, we learn that they served him. 
They ministered to him. But this, this is the same word that is used in 1045 that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. This is a key concept in discipleship. The fact that they were following Jesus and that they were serving. These are key marks of a disciple in this gospel. And so we're, we're meant to see and to celebrate these women as being full-fledged disciples of Jesus. And all the women that it mentions were coming up with them to Jerusalem. It's really special that Mark is, is highlighting this for us. So what has Mark's overall presentation of women been in his gospel? Now, they play a very significant role. Fifteen different women are highlighted in the gospel as a whole. They've been mentioned around 22 times, but 15 different women. But only four of them are named. First was Herodias, who's actually kind of a, a, a bad guy, or bad girl. She, uh, she was the wife of Herod. She's the only other one that's named, other than these three women. It's kind of significant that we're getting all three of them right here. Well, overall, women have really been shown in this gospel in a very unusually positive light. It's unusual compared to what you would expect for this day and age. So we have to acknowledge that, that at this time, women, they, they did not hold positions of importance within society. And uh, in Mark's gospel, however, they are presented at, as models of discipleship and faith. If we think back to the, the Syrophoenician woman who uh, approached Jesus, and, and he actually used her in that sandwich account uh, to highlight her faith. And then uh, there was also the woman who approached Jesus when he was going to heal Jairus' daughter, also in one of those sandwich structures. And, and both of these women were used to demonstrate the great faith that a disciple needed to have. And so in the, all of these sandwich structures, you, they're, they're in the middle demonstrating that. And so we, we might say that they are the, the creme de la creme in Mark's gospel. In this case, the cream and the cookie. All right? Now, something is different, though, this time. They're not the cream and the cookie. They're the cookie. They're on the outside of the sandwich structure. So already we're starting to wonder what, what part are they going to play in this? But in the beginning, we, we have a very positive first impression uh, of these women. They're still on the scene, but all the male disciples have fled in, in fear and in deserting Jesus. And so they show a degree of faithfulness that was missing in the other disciples. But it says that they're looking on. The verb there kind of means observing from a distance. And already this idea of distance is maybe signaling to us in a very subtle way, we have to wait and see, but signaling to us perhaps there's something that's off about their approach, maybe what's going on in their heart. Well, in verses, we move on to look at the center of this sandwich structure here, Joseph of Arimathea. We're introduced to Joseph, and, and we see him, and we're introduced to him by his, by his reputation, and by his actions, what he does. Uh, and we're, we're told a bit about his motives. By his reputation, we see that he was, a, he was a prominent member of the council. This idea of him being prominent means he was of high standing. And we can interpret from that that he was probably also very wealthy. He probably was a man of means. Most of the people on the council were actually wealthy. And so we can, we can see from just this description of him that he was a person of position and probably of great possessions. All right, so that means that he had a lot to lose by his association with Jesus. That should stand out to us. But then we also see in his actions, we learn a great deal about this man from his actions. That he took courage and he went to Pilate and he asked for the body of this enemy of the state, this man that had just been crucified for a false claim to be a king over and above Caesar. At least that's how they interpreted it. So he stood there while Pilate investigated and confirmed that Jesus was, in, in fact, dead. A lot of these details can refute some of those claims that Jesus just swooned on the cross and then awoke in the tomb. 
Well, Pilate went to great lengths to confirm from the centurion, our friend the centurion, that he was indeed dead. And from the testimony of that centurion, Pilate then granted, he says, the corpse to this Joseph. To this man who obviously had affection for this Jesus, who he looked to probably as the Messiah, he was granted the corpse. This had to have been a harsh word to fall upon his ears. And so Joseph personally took the body of Jesus off of the cross, and he, had, he wrapped him in a linen shroud, and finally he placed him in a tomb, which is presumably his own family tomb. I mean, people didn't have just extra tombs lying around. It was likely his own family tomb, something that was forbidden to do according to the law, according to the, the Mishnah. Well, all of this actually fulfills Isaiah 59.9. that says that they would, they would try to bury him with criminals, but in fact he would be buried in the tomb of a wealthy person. You can look at Isaiah 59.9 to see how that's fulfilled in this event. So we have to ask ourselves, why, why is this Joseph who had so much to lose in his possession, position and his prominence and his wealth, why did he take this action? What moved him to take such dangerous, a dangerous step of associating and aligning himself with this Jesus? It says that he was looking for the kingdom of God. He wasn't looking to preserve his own earthly kingdom, his own earthly position in this kingdom, kingdom of this world. So evidently looking to Jesus as the one who would bring the kingdom, he took this action. He puts his position and his great possessions at risk, and he aligns himself with Jesus. And he's willing to so closely align himself with Jesus that he, he personally pulls his body down from the cross and goes about wrapping it in the shroud and placing it in his own tomb. Well, in verse 47, we quickly return to the women who are still looking on from a distance. So they saw where he was laid. What did they see? From their perspective, what did they see? They saw their rabbi wrapped tightly in grave clothes and placed in a tomb that is carved out of solid rock, sealed tightly by an enormous stone. It doesn't mention it here, but we also know from other accounts and from history that this would have been sealed with a Roman seal guarded. We know it was guarded, but Mark doesn't give us those details. But really, there's, there's nothing about this scene from their perspective that looks hopeful. It all looks very, very final. So what do they do? Well, they went home. The next day was the Sabbath. A day of rest. And we can only kind of presume what, what they talked about as they walked home in discouragement. Perhaps they thought ahead, well, I mean, we're not going to be able to do anything tomorrow. Um, it's going to be two days later. We're going, to need, we're going to need to buy spices. We're going to need to buy ointments to perfume his body. It's going to be two days from now. And so they probably made their plan for what they were going to do in two days' time. It wasn't going to be a pleasant task, but they loved him, and they wanted to show him honor. So they, they made their preparations. And now we, we fast forward in verse 1 of chapter 16. We fast forward to Sunday morning. There's, there's not anything really told to us in, in the Gospels about Saturday. It was other than just the fact that it was the Sabbath, where nothing happened. It was a day where they ceased from their labor, and... They rested. This wasn't much of a day of rest, we can assume that much. Because how do you celebrate the Sabbath when the Lord of the Sabbath is dead and in a grave? Well, we see that in these verses, that these three women, Mary, the two Marys, and Salome, that they were, 
without the rock to move the stone. And what do I mean by that? These three, these three women were, were without the rock to move the stone. Well, two days later, the 11 disciples are still in hiding. And, and we have these three women who are willing to schlep this, this large load of ointments and spices out to the gravesite, but they've got a problem. They don't have anyone to help them to move the stone. And Mark's gospel is the only one that gives us those details about what they were talking about along the way. They say, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Wouldn't it be really nice to have Peter, the one they called the rock, this big burly fisherman who was used to moving huge loads of fish? Wouldn't it be nice to have this big, big strong man with them to, to move that stone. And sorry guys, but this is not a very pleasant passage for us. He doesn't pull any punches here. But the absence of this, of faithful, capable men, is, is a very glaring problem in this passage. These women needed some men of faith to step up and pull their weight, literally. I think we should move on because that's far too convicting. <laughs> well, problem four. Pro problem solved. Okay, we have supernatural in intervention. The stone is already rolled away. So thank goodness we can move on. Upon entering the tomb, they see a young man in a white robe. And we're told that they were alarmed. But what's so alarming about a young man sitting there calmly in, in a white robe? I mean... We know from Matthew, we know from other accounts, we, we know that this was an angel. And this is kind of a typical response to an angel. I don't think Mark really wants us to think, oh, this is an angel. Angels are very intimidating. Of course, they were alarmed. We're just meant to focus in on their alarm. And he reduces the details, details down about this angel for a very intentional purpose. So we'll pay attention to those. So... What is his message? What does he tell them? Angels, the word angel means messenger. What is his message? Well, it's, it's essentially the gospel. He tells them the gospel, an announcement of good news. And if you had to reduce the gospel down into as few words as possible, you, you might as well just say what he said. He is risen. That's, that's a good summary of the gospel. He is risen. Of course, you might ask why. Well, I mean, risen from what? And, and, and what brought this about? But... When I moved to France, that was the first time that I ever encountered that tradition of arriving at church on Easter morning and having, having everyone, as you greet people, say, He is risen, and responding, He is risen indeed. And we didn't do that in the churches I grew up in. And I love that tradition, and I know I'm going to take that with me where, wherever I go in my life. But it's a beautiful pronouncement. It's so fun to come to church on Easter morning and be able to say that to people. We should say it the rest of the year. Well, he actually gives them, in his, what he communicates to them, he gives them four imperatives, four commands. And we're going to walk through those four commands. And the first here is, do not be alarmed. He sees their alarm, he knows their alarm, but he's literally saying, do not be distressed. And this is the same word that was used of Jesus' distress in the garden when he was distressed and troubled, when he was praying. And just as it took Jesus, just as for Jesus, it took faith in looking to his Father to overcome that distress, these women are also going to have to be invited to hear and believe the good news about Jesus in order to overcome this distress. He says to them, Then you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. And in this short statement, it, it really indicates a lot to us about where they are, where, they're at, where they are in their heart. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. How are they seeking? The verb seeking here, we might not normally pay close attention to that, but this is a, a, a particular key word in the book of Mark. Spiritual sight, we've said over and over again, is key in Mark. But seeking has been used ten times and always in a negative sense. 
always in a negative sense. Now, whenever someone was said to be seeking Jesus, they were not being portrayed to be a true and faithful disciple. They weren't correctly discerning who he was. And so this is the first clue in this passage of where their heart is and a potential problem that's arising. But who are they seeking? It says that they're seeking Jesus of Nazareth, a reference to his hometown. And also, this is kind of a a negative clue as to where they're at because they're seeking Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus of heaven. If we think back to the use of, of the word Nazareth, that place in the whole book of Mark, then we remember hearing it sometimes on the voice of a demon who were calling out identifying Jesus of Nazareth. We remember that Jesus couldn't do miracles in his hometown because of their lack of faith, and they just saw him as the hometown boy. We, we may also remember blind Bartimaeus, that, that 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 model of faith and discipleship who heard the crowd saying, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. But what did he say? He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So over and over again, the identification of Jesus as being Jesus of Nazareth is a signal that someone wasn't quite discerning properly who this Jesus is. We're responding to him properly. And so most recently we actually heard this name on the lips of the servant girl who identified Peter as the one who followed the Nazarene, Jesus. Each time there's an indication that the person just sees him simply as Jesus of Nazareth. They must be missing something. Well, what, what does he say further? He says that... He was crucified. The young man adds that final clause that he was crucified. fulfilling, And and then there's a full stop, period. He was crucified. Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. To them, uh, Jesus was crucified and, and nothing more because they're still unaware of what's actually already happened, what has already happened taken place, but they're unaware. They have not yet been told. Actually, in this past year, I I learned about a a day, a a holiday, a memorial day in the U.S. that I was relatively unaware of before this past year. I just was informed about it. It's called Juneteenth. And it it, it commemorates June 19th, which was the day that a, a major general in the Union Army in the American Civil War made it to um, the Union Army, made progress toward Texas, the more remote uh, state within the southern states, and actually announced in Galveston the emancipation and enforcement of that emancipation of slaves in the South. I didn't know about this event. I didn't know that it was still commemorated. But on January 1st in 1863, Abraham Lincoln had already declared these slaves free. It wasn't until two and a half years later, on June 19th, 1865, that that pronouncement actually came into effect all throughout the Union. It wasn't until that date that they, were, that they heard and it was enforced by the highest authority in the land that they were indeed free when they were finally told. With these women standing in this empty tomb full of fear and despair because they, they, they don't know why this tomb is empty. They just don't know yet. There's a period and we need to continue. They didn't have to wait two and a half years. He continues... He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. This is the good news. And in this second imperative to see is also a call to become witnesses. 
It is a call to, in a way, have a change of an identity. To change from just being someone who knew and followed Jesus and served him along the way, but someone who has seen his resurrection and has encountered this reality and now has become a witness. And it's also really amazing that, that Mark has chosen to put the full weight of the testimony of Jesus' resurrection on the testimony of these three women, whose testimony in this day would not have been admissible in a court of law. Their testimony is null and void, which is evidence that this is a true account. Because why else would anyone write this? If you were making this up, you would not have put the weight of evidence on the testimony of these three women. So it adds credibility to this gospel. But they become witnesses in this. And here they become something new. They become witnesses with a testimony. And so we have two more imperatives that go along with that. He tells them, go and tell. The final two imperatives. And that's what witnesses do. They encounter the good news about Jesus. That he had died as our substitute, and that he was, has risen in victory over sin and death. And they are to go and tell others. And Peter. They are to go and tell the other disciples and Peter. Now, Jim already mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, that this was a signal of Peter's restoration. What do you think this communicated to Peter? It should communicate to that disciple grace and mercy who had failed. But now he's being invited to come and receive his restoration. He should have heard it as an invitation. Say, hey man, this Jesus, he's going before you to Galilee, Galilee and he wants you to meet him there. He wants to see you. He wants to continue to include him, you in his plan. This is good news. This is good news for all disciples who have failed in some way. And we all have. Failed. And sometimes we get stuck in our guilt and our shame. And we disqualify ourselves from being used by God in His kingdom. So what, what will these four women do with these imperatives? Do not be alarmed. See that this tomb is empty. See where he was. And now go and tell. In verse 8, they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. What a letdown. What a disappointment, right? This is the final verse of the gospel. What a disappointment. We had such high hopes for these women who had stuck with Jesus when all of the men fled. What is happening? And I know we'll be tempted to harmonize these, this verse with the other Gospels that indicates that mixed with this fear there was also joy. But Mark isn't taking us to where they ended up. He's, he's leaving us in this moment of hesitation in a fear where they started. They got there. They told the disciples. Everybody in the original audience knew that the gospel got out to the disciples and they eventually carried the message forward and it got to Rome and Peter was associated. They knew Peter. They know it got out. But this is how Mark chooses to leave us as a reader of this gospel. And he's doing something really intentional and actually bold in basically ending his gospel with a dot, 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 an ellipsis, a to be continued. So we're meant to ask ourselves, what if? What if it stayed there? What if they stayed in their fear? What if they didn't live out their new identity as witnesses? What if they didn't go and tell? 
And so, as Papias later added a great commission on the ending of Mark, because they felt like it needed to be there, I would say this is Mark's great commission. This verse. This is the cliffhanger ending to the book of Mark that actually has your marching orders. This is where he writes you into the story. This is your invitation to join this story, this true story, to go and tell. It identifies the mission of every true disciple. Everyone who has heard the good news that by believing it and receiving their salvation, receiving forgiveness for sin, having the assurance of that victory through the cross and the resurrection, to not remain silent because of fear, but to go out and to tell. To become witnesses because we have a testimony. And people with a testimony have a job. It's to testify. It's to give their testimony. This, this final section of Mark, it also identifies the, the greatest threat to the message going out. And that's fear. We've seen it throughout. We saw the, these three women, they were looking on from a distance. There was great threat to associating yourself with Jesus. And we also saw that they were overcome with fear upon entering the tomb, and then they remained silent because of their fear. And they were our last hope. Well, Joseph of Arimathea, in, in his inclusion in this story, we see actually the, the opposite. We see someone who overcame real reasons legitimate reasons to be fearful. We saw the possibility of the loss of his position and his possessions. But he overcame these fears and it was because he was seeking Jesus' kingdom. Another kingdom. Not his own. And then this, this mention of Peter, it brings up a fear that is probably the greatest hindrance to us participating in this mission and getting the message of the gospel out. And that's the fear of disqualification because of our own failure, our own sin. Do you feel disqualified to carry the message to an unbelieving world? Or do you count yourself as disqualified because of past sin? Jesus is no longer in that tomb. But if we don't share it with other people, then he might as well be there. Peter and the other disciples don't get this message, then he might as well be in the tomb because no one will hear. Peter's invitation to meet Jesus is foreshadowing his restoration. And that's actually where we're going to go next week with kind of an epilogue to this sermon series. But there's, there's actually more in this passage that communicates to us how we are restored and qualified to join this mission. And it comes through in the details, now follow me here, of the linen cloth that Joseph buys to wrap Jesus in and the white robe that is worn by this young man in the tomb, this angelic figure. The words might not stand out to us in a uh, casual reading of the text, but one commentator called these words a, a cipher, which is really just like, oh, I... I remember him mentioning a young man before and a linen cloth. That reminds me of Mark 14, where we saw a young man who was wearing a linen cloth. And he, he failed. He, he was trying to follow Jesus, but he got caught and he ran away naked. And we talked about how that was a symbol for the failure of the disciples and their shame for denying Jesus and leaving him abandoned. That linen cloth became a garment of shame. We also remember um, a white garment as well. If we think back to the transfiguration where the mention uh, there of Jesus being transfigured before them, where before James, Peter, James, and John, his clothes became radiant intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And of course, this represents his holiness, his glory. And this is the second time in the Gospel of Mark that we hear that announcement, that pronouncement from God of Jesus' acceptability 
his divine endorsement of Jesus as his beloved son, and he says, listen to him. Listen to him. Why should anyone listen to me? I'm not qualified to carry the gospel message to the world. world. I'm not, I don't have enough training. I'm not trained to do that. Well, at least I'm not as qualified as this other guy over here. I'm not qualified to teach others what's contained in this book. And main, main, re, main reason is I can't even follow it myself most of the time. I'm just going to mess it up. Now, hold on. What do we see in this passage? Look closely. We see an exchange of clothes. We see Jesus wrapped in a linen cloth, that garment of shame that symbolizes our failure. He takes it from us. And then we see a young man in the tomb. Where is he seated? Why does Mark even include that detail? Where is he seated? On the right side. The position of honor. And what is he wearing? A white robe. A garment of holiness. We see an exchange of clothes. This is what happens through Jesus' death and resurrection. We are declared righteous. We receive His righteousness. Our sin and shame is taken upon Him. I don't think these are meaningless details. I think that they are written into this chapter in such a way that we should get this message. That through Christ's death as our substitute, that the victory that comes through the resurrection, that, that you are qualified to be a witness so that people should listen to you as you go and tell, fulfilling that role in his kingdom. You can go and tell others. Now, I, I want to conclude with uh, reading a quotation that, that I came across that just really challenged me, and I want to leave it with you. It's about our inclusion into this story. I'll read this and close in prayer. Is there anyone else who might, after all, be a faithful disciple? Throughout this story, there has been a non-participant observer who has been with Jesus in every scene. The narrator has permitted the reader to be with Jesus the whole time, from beginning to end. The reader heard the voice of God declaring Jesus to be his son when no one else heard. The reader was present with Jesus in the wilderness, tested by Satan when no one else was there. When family rejected him, the reader persisted. When religious leaders, crowds, and disciples misunderstood and abandoned Jesus, the reader stood by him. When the inner circle went to sleep in Gethsemane, oblivious to Jesus' plea to watch with him on, on the hour, the one hour, the reader stayed awake and heard Jesus anguished in prayer. When the disciples fled and were absent at the cross, the reader was present. When Jesus cried out to God in abandonment, the reader was still there. Now the readers, that's you and I, we stand at the brink of the incomplete narrative in which all have failed. And with terrible restraint, the narrator breaks off the story and leaves the readers who may have thought the story was about someone else with a decision to make. Dot, dot, dot. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that in your wisdom that you led Mark to proclaim the gospel message in this way, to teach us not just a report of the details of Jesus' life, as a matter of fact, but to challenge us in various ways throughout telling of it to follow him, 
to have faith to see, to have eyes to see and ears to hear, to be willing to look within, to be watchful, to pay attention to what's going on in our heart, what challenges may exist there, what may cause us to deny Him and be unwilling to suffer and follow and persist in following Him. So I thank you that in this final passage of the book of Mark, there's this challenge to go and tell. And you had the wisdom to not make it just about the facts and the details, the, the truth that Jesus rose from the dead, establishing victory over sin and death. But you, you invite us to be your witnesses. Lord, I pray that you would help us to receive our qualification as ministers of reconciliation, as your ambassadors, as people with a testimony to share about our encounter with you. Help us to go out in faith and do that. In Jesus' name. Amen.